Welcome to Speaking of Men. This is public access television from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm your host, Mike Rivas. Joining us in the studio today is Edward W. Wood, Jr. Ed is a resident of Denver, Colorado, an author who has received two Wurlitzer Foundation grants and an award from the National Council of Senior Citizens. Wounded during the liberation of France in the summer of 1944, he began a journey of discovery reflected in his new memoir on being wounded. Welcome to the program, Ed. It's nice to be here. Would you uh, like to uh, let us hear how this journey began? We'll have to go back to the summer of 1944 on the banks of the Canal de Mines, about 20 miles north of Metz, France. We, my company, my squad was under artillery fire. The men at my side had their foxholes half dug. They had moved farther out from the tree trunk where the roots were smaller. I scrambled over the ground to their side. No one spoke to me. I started to dig. My shovel blade met no roots. It pierced the deep black earth, the sweet earth in which I would soon hide. And then, then, oh then, the slam of a sledgehammer hit my flesh and lifted me high and I whirled up and up and up through a tunnel of green leaves toward the sky, my hands extended as if to grasp those leaves and the dark brown limbs rushing by me, halting my flight into eternity. My fingers brushed over them, they would not hold. I flew higher into the sky and seemed to merge with the clouds, mixed with their, mixed with their wispy tendrils, not knowing whether to continue this arc toward eternity or fall back to the sweet, sweet earth. With a falling, sliding swoop, I tumbled out of the sky, fell to my knees. I put my fingers to my face. Blood, thick and red and dark, swiftly pumping, covered them. I reached up and touched my head. My helmet was gone. Blood poured from a hole on the left side of my skull. A hard lump protruded from my torn scalp. A piece of shrapnel was embedded in the bone. I looked behind me. My pants were ripped away, my right buttock blown open. Beneath the yellow-white fat, I could see the red raw meat, like the steaks my father once fed me. Hold still, Wood, hold still, the medic cried, blood from the tip of his wounded nose spraying my face. Stop wiggling, goddammit. I got to get this morphine in you. The blood from his own wound sprinkled over me like spittle from a dying breeze. When the shelling stopped, they lifted me into an ambulance parked at the side of the road. My journey into the land of the wounded began in that ambulance, and being moved by it from battalion aid station into World War I bunkers, I smelled the sweet, cloying odor of blood, felt it drip on me from the stretcher above where the man the soldier within it died. Here at the front, before there were forms and bureaucrats to describe and fasten to me some categories of wound and pain, I touched men who for a moment cared for me with greater compassion than I had ever experienced at any time or place in my life. Gentleness and compassion, so difficult, so difficult for the American male to express Emotions always held there but held back, contained by some impenetrable shell, breaking open now and warming me after I was wounded, as if love could only be given within the frame of violence and one must be expressed in conjunction with the other. This, the language of war and peace, violence and love, hate and compassion, I have sought to understand on my 40-year journey through the land of the wounded. That's where it started, Mike. As a, I was 19 years old that summer. I was a boy. That's, uh, I really enjoy hearing you read that. I enjoyed your reading at the corner bookstore last evening. The uh, concept of the wounded male is much discussed uh, in men's circles these days as a topic. Uh, do you have any comments on that? I think that the Wounded male comes from the kind of violence that I experienced, you know, the direct, brutal confrontation of combat. But there are also other kinds of wounds that I think are so important for males. One of those, and an essential one, is the relationship between the male as a boy and his mother and his father. 
And I think so many of the wounds we have as males have to be looked at, remembered from that early childhood when our fathers often are not there and we receive so much of our knowledge from our mothers. So there are two kinds of wounds I write about, the wounds of combat and the wounds of family. So we have uh, uh, two different kinds. You, you're basically dealing not only the physical but the spiritual. As Very well, much the so. Emotional. We're going to take a short break here for some public ser service announcements and uh, a tip from the Parent Craft Organization. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. We're speaking today with Ed Wood about his current uh, memoir on being wounded. Ed, um, how did this book come to be? Well, as I just read the wound that I had when I was 19, it changed my life totally. And uh, I spent the next 40 years, both consciously and unconsciously, trying to understand those wounds and the wounds of combat and the wounds between my mother and my father and myself. And it came to me that I had learned a lot about healing. And I felt that I had a book to write, so I quit my profession of city planning. And I sat down, and it took me 10 years, but I wrote this book. I feel very happy about it. Uh, you know, the concept of the wounded male is a much discussed topic in, uh, the, men's, uh, in, the, in the men's movement. Do you have comments on that you might uh, like to make? Yeah, I really do. I think that uh, wounds lead to something that's so difficult to handle, which is the concept of enemies. We feel that the people who wound us, and they are, of course, the, the Germans who shot me are our enemies, and we also feel that uh, because our parents wound us, that they are our enemies as well. And we go through life, I think, many times living with the paranoia of enemies. Some of them may not be real. Some of them may be the memory of, the, of, the, of, our, of our childhood. We project on others. We were talking about that a little while ago in work situation where we project enemies. And it seems to me that coming to terms with the wound inside of ourselves, with the enemies that wound has created is probably one of the most important values of life and maturity. And it's, it's just a different kind of thing, I think, maybe for men and for women than from women. You bet. Um, so you're saying that uh, it's necessary to accept that pain and deal with it at some point and uh, not project so much uh, blame out there and make it everybody else's fault. Well, I did that for a long time, but I was a very unhappy man. I ended up getting into the power trip. You know, I thought the answer, that was my answer to wounds. If I had enough power, I could uh, control the world and control reality. And I learned that that's, uh, that, that Lord Acton said it best, power tend to, tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And uh, it doesn't heal wounds, believe me. You get all the power in the world, you can still be a very hurt person within. You bet. Uh, men in opposition to violence is um, always topical. Uh, did you have something you wanted to read or discuss? And well, well, not just read, because I think that there's a hidden undercurrent in our society. There's a hidden history that is really not taught in school. And that history is the history of the people who've opposed violence in the United States. You know, we founded, and this is not known at all, the United States founded the peace movement. It started right here in this country. We don't hear about that. It goes back to the people who opposed uh, the 1680s, the first man to say, I won't serve in the United States. He was a Quaker, but he refused to do it. And it goes back to the Civil War, and it goes to the Mexican-American War. And yeah, I do have something. I, I'm very proud of this. In 1847, in the Mexican-American War, my great-great-great-uncle sat down one day in his home in Blanford, Massachusetts, and he wrote this message. If any man say he love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. Now can any man love his brother and at the same time be doing him the greatest possible injury by seeking to take his life? I think not. Yet that is true with regard to all engaged in the business of war these mutual hostility to each other. Perhaps some would endeavor to apologize for war in certain circumstances, but I think it would be very difficult to justify the practice in any circumstances, and most of all at the present time by the United States. Levi D. Tiffany, October 8, 1847. Oh, and I found that family paper tucked in the, after my father died, I found that tucked in, the, in his... Uh, 
some, you know, in his boxes. I'll be, that's, that's a beautiful piece Isn't of work. Isn't that a beautiful piece of writing? Well, the, 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 the style of speaking is, is uh, yeah, very he's, eloquent. He's, and I've got all his other journals at home. He's a great man, I think. You bet. So you guys have had some writers in your family for well, a few not, generations? Well, not published, but of people who kept journals and letters and, yeah, that's right. And there's a real interest in journaling that's as, a, that's as right, a part of yeah. the journey, too. Um, there's a, a lot of interest today in the wounded child within us and uh, adult children's issues. Have you, uh, re have you been able to reconcile uh, childhood relationships and trauma? In, uh, well, this is very important to me. I had a very trouble. I've talked before about wounds in my parents. I had a very troubled relationship with my parents. My father was a charming, powerful man who made a lot of money, went bankrupt, and made a lot of money again. My mother was a uh, beautiful woman, stunning woman, and they had a whole different set of values. My father's were, was power, was uh, strength, control. My mother's was the kind of compassion and love. And so as I grew up, just having awful times with that, and then after I was wounded, my mother smothered me with love a great deal. The hurt son, she took me into herself and I accepted it, but that made difficult relations with, with other uh, women. And I was very angry, and I blamed them for what was my problems, you see. I was a grown man. It was my problem by then. And finally, I've learned they're dead now, and I have come to see that my parents did the best job they could, absolutely the best, and they were very wonderful people. And what I feel today is an enormous tenderness and uh, caring for them and what they gave me. And I've forgiven them, and I hope to God that they've forgiven me because I was a very brash, very angry, and very bitter, and rather, I think on retrospect, rather unpleasant young man. Uh, and the core of it all is forgiveness. I mean, the getting rid of enemies is forgiveness. You know, the Bible, forgive, forgive thy enemies. Christ said it pretty well. And it's a very simple thing, but very hard to do. Letting go of that resentment. And, ah, and, letting, and, and going within. And, Finding it there. Being possessed by hatred is really a, a terrible thing for anyone. That's right. Um, how has um, how's this journey that you've uh, uh, of exploration that you've taken uh, affected your own fathering? How is um, well? It's 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 something that I, I I've puzzled about for my whole life. I will say two things. One is I think wonderful, and the other, at least in retrospect, is very ter terrible. The wonderful thing is that. Uh, that having my kids was the best thing that ever happened to me. It, I think, and I, find, I wrote a poem once, so it made a man out of me. It's an old word, but it made me realize what responsibility. And it was after that terrible period. I had a major breakdown after I was wounded. And uh, the other thing was, though, that I proceeded to want to solve my wounds by, by having power, by making the same trip as my father. So I, by a variety of ways, after I had a, after I, got over my uh, emotional travail from being wounded. I got a fellowship at MIT, went the route of uh, Washington and uh, first class airplane flights and martinis up front and uh, the whole bag of it. And I became a terrible father in that time. I worked 60 to 80 hours a week and I lost my kids essentially. And then finally when I woke up, I started to write my book, I suddenly realized that I had made some serious errors in my life, and I came back to this marvelous sense of what fatherhood's all about. I think I hurt my children. I don't think I hurt. Just as I was hurt, I passed it on because I didn't grow up early enough. And uh, we get along well now. Still some problems, but we, we, we've, we're reconciling ourselves. It took a lot of work. I think that a lot of young men are hurt as I was today, hurt by either by war, consequences of Vietnam. I think the guys who are going to come back from the Persian Gulf War who are going to be hurt by guilt for what they did, are hurt by our parents and our siblings. And I think that this whole role of mentoring, of trying to get to know these guys, I have a lot of friends in their 20s and 30s. and. Uh, it's, it's, it's just an awfully nice thing to be, and I think there's a huge role for men and 
working with younger men. Of course, I'm older, but I think it's a very important thing. Well, you know that whole um, necessity for a nation to grieve uh, right. wars, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the fact that uh, we killed a lot of people in the Gulf, and that uh, in taking a life you wound yourself, and uh, not accepting that and refusing uh, to accept that and denying that leaves you possessed by it. It's uh, real important, I think, for all Americans to, um, uh, to look at the darker side as well as the light side. Uh, you know, violence is an everyday reality for many of us in America today. You, know, you and I were talking about some, uh, boys in the hood as yeah. an example. Uh -huh. Uh, uh, would you like to talk about that violence and how it affects us and, and the violence that we as men are prone to? Oh, I would very much like to do that. Before I get, I'd like to respond to your point about war in the Persian Gulf and, and just pick that up just a little. It, uh, it's not just the Persian Gulf. Going back to the war in which I was in, World War II, I think that World War II is viewed in this country, you know, Studs Terkel called it, quote, the good war, close quotes. And actually, I think we have to change our national viewpoint on that war. We have to recognize that 60 million people were killed, four or five that times that number wounded, cities were decimated, places explored that were never, and destroyed that were never, would never be the same again. And even more, that out of it came this terrible Cold War which really cursed us for 40 years, 45 years. And there's a tragedy there, a need to grieve for what happened. I have newspaper clippings at home. I was a high school class, class of 1942. Of my friends in high school, I read them who were killed. And so violence is a key thing for manhood. Violence is essential to understanding what manhood is all about and learning to grieve and forgive ourselves and our enemies. I think it's so important. Thank you, Edward W. Wood. Uh, we're going to take another short break here for some public service announcements. Please stay with us because we're going to be right back. We're speaking today with Ed Wood, author of On Being Wounded, about being wounded. Uh, Ed, uh, violence is an everyday reality for a lot of Americans uh, today. Uh, let's continue to talk about that a little bit. It certainly is what you just said, is that uh, unfortunately, according to many indices, the United States is one of the most violent nations in the Western world. And all of us have to deal with violence every day, either personally to us or seeing it in the news or the movies we see today. And it seems to me that in the new... Uh, definition of manhood that we're struggling to find that uh, that refusing that violence is a way to is the way to think about it and just say no I'm not going to do this I'm not going to uh, have weapons and I'm not going to use them and I'm not going to try and treat my body as a weapon you know you don't need a weapon to be violent you've got you've got these things and and learning to relate to people in different kinds of ways I think it's the great challenge of this country today I it's just so important in the age of communications, we don't communicate very well. That's something I return to a lot. I, I think that's true. And again, we go back to what I said before. We, we seize on people and they become our enemies. And they may not be our real enemies. I mean, that's our childhood because we haven't forgiven ourselves. How can we forgive, or forgive the, our neighbor? or our, our boss, or our other kind of people. And I'm, by, I'm not saying, by the way, that bad. I'm not a Pollyanna. Anybody who's worked in Washington, D.C. for a while is, does not awake, come away thinking they're not bad people out there. But I do think that you can handle them in different kinds of ways than, uh, than returning violence for violence. I really believe that. You bet. Um, uh, you know, we're in the last five, six minutes of the program here. Do you have any final advice or uh, things that you might like to say to our viewers about what you're trying to do here and what the purpose of the book is and what your feelings are? Well, I think what I've said, summing up, that, that being wounded is really, it seems at first the worst thing that ever happened to us, whether it's emotionally or physically. 
But you know, it's really a passage to maturity if you deal with it prop properly. It's a way to, uh, to grow. It's a way to learn to love in the, in, the, in the deepest kind of way. And I think it's just so important. And I, it sounds a funny thing to say, but I, I thank God that it happened to me when I was a young man because it changed my life and it made me into a lot better person than I would have been. And I think this is true for other people, for other males. You bet. Um, you, have, um, uh, you have any other final comments you might like to make? I know you were at the corner bookstore uh, yesterday uh, for a reading. I know we can get your book there. Are there other places we might oh, be able no, to I find think it? they'll be in most places. Uh, Dalton's carries it, I understand. It can be ordered, and uh, the other major bookstores carry it, and I feel very lucky that they do. Now, other final comments I really would like to make is that uh, knowing that violence can be overcome, I think that we can change the change the nature of the world, change the nature of the, of the country. I grew up as a southern boy in Mississippi and Alabama, and all I ever had was weapons and the fact that I should be a soldier. And now I'm a Quaker. I believe sincerely in nonviolence. I try, and God knows I fail. I try and practice it. And uh, I do believe that it can be given up and I think that this is the greatest thing that we have today. And I also feel quite strongly that what we have to resist is the violence that we see and hear on the media and every day of our life. What I have developed is a philosophy of what I call art, nature, and God. Art, writing, the belief in the natural world, and the belief in, uh, in what... My definition is God, and it, it helps keep me going, man. You bet it does. Well, I've um, uh, certainly uh, uh, enjoyed seeing you read uh, last night, and I, I've enjoyed having you here today. Um, I would. Uh, do you have uh, some other books that you've written? You have written some other. No, I've, I haven't. I did. Took me ten years to write this, and it was a, it was the compelling force of my life. And I wanted to mention this, that I think it's very important for people who want to do something with their life, with it, particularly for men, is do it before you get too old. I quit my profession at 52 to uh, uh, be a writer, and by God, I made it. It took me 10 years to write this book. Well, Edward W. Wood, Jr., we certainly appreciate you being here today speaking about uh, your novel on being wounded, available at B. Dalton's Corner Bookstore and other places across the nation. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone who's helped make this program possible, especially you. Uh, we'd also like to thank our viewers for watching. If you'd like to comment on this show, get in touch. This is Mike Rivas uh, reminding you to stand if you can. You run if you have to, but don't you quit. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. It was fun. <laughs>